Anyway, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. If nothing else, maybe this catches our attention when I give you a title of Congratulations for Your Sorrow. Matthew 5, 4. I ran across a story, and it appeared that many preachers have told this story. It is a true story. I had never read it. I've never told it. But many years ago in a Moscow theater, a man named Alexander, I'm going to mess this up, Rostasev, okay. He was said to have been saved while he was playing the role of Jesus in a play. Not not a play in church. It was actually a secular play. It, It wasn't giving respect to God or honor to God. It was a sacrilegious play. The the title of the play was Christ in a Tuxedo. Part of the lines that he was to read come from the Sermon on the Mount here. And then after he was to read two verses on the Sermon on the Mount, he was to remove whatever type of gown he was wearing and cry out, give me my tuxedo and top hat. And so he gets started with his lines. I mean, the play is live. It's going on. And he reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. After he got past those two lines, he didn't get to give me my tuxedo and top hat. As the story goes, he trembled and he went off script and he just kept reading the Sermon on the Mount. People were given the old fake cough <coughs> because he's off script and, and they were tapping their foot and he was ignoring every sign as he just kept reading Matthew chapter 5. As the story goes, before they could drop the curtain, Alexander had trusted in Jesus Christ right then and there as his Lord and Savior. The story says that he he trembled over that. He read the words, Blessed are they that, that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Sounds like Alexander mourned. As he was saved. Mourned over his sin. As he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trembling. So I say to that story. Not knowing anything about him. Or, or religious background before that. Or what led up to it or anything. Just the, just the testimony of a profession of faith. In Jesus Christ. I say congratulations Alexander. On your sorrow. Mourning. Mourning. Now, now I'm not talking about the first part of the day. Okay. Mourning, it speaks of sadness, grieving, cry, crying out, even wailing. People wore sackcloth in the Old Testament, and, and in a time of grieving and mourning, they would, they would rip the sackcloth, and they would shave their heads, and, and, and beat their chest, and, and do different things. Mourning. This is something that we try to avoid. We, we don't like moments of sadness or, or moments of grief. We, we try to cling to and, and embrace and cherish moments of laughter, moments of joy, of, of having a lot of fun. That's, that's what we try to do. We, we want to be full of happiness. And that's opposite of mourning. That's opposite of this word mourn here. And yet... We find something opposite of this word mourn in this, vo- in this verse tonight. It's, 
It's a very interesting verse. Jesus says, Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed speaks of happiness. And, and I know how we talk about how we would rather have the joy of the Lord than happiness in this world. And we, we dummy down and call that word happiness negative. But that, that's what that word means there. And so it speaks well of a spiritual happiness. Jesus is telling us of a, of a spiritual joy, a happiness that we can have when, when He says, Blessed, blessed are they that mourn. What a paradox. It's saying, happy are you if you're sad. Never a man spake like this, man. Happy are you if you're sad. Fixed are you if you're broken. We could go, we could go on and on in, in how this looks to contradict one another. How are we blessed if we mourn? Somebody that's blessed, I, I expect to see a smile on their face. Maybe some laughter. You know, maybe jumping for joy. Doing a cartwheel, ecstatic over something. But Jesus says, blessed are they that mourn. How are we blessed if we mourn? Jesus says here, we're happy when we're made low. Or, or maybe lamenting, we could say. Broken hearted. How are we blessed if we mourn? Why do we mourn if we're blessed? I mean, to, to the natural mind, that doesn't make sense. That, that just, you know, where, where are you going with this, Jesus? What does this mean? It goes completely against our natural frame of mind. Mourning. You know, you know we could talk about mourning in general. And you can use this for a lot, thinking about a lot of things that we would mourn over. We mourn over the suffering that we go through in life. We mourn over the suffering of others. We mourn over having loss in life. We mourn when one of our loved ones pass, pass away. Right now we mourn for Israel and what families in Israel are going through. But in the Sermon on the Mount, what, what can we get to as, as a major part of this mourning? What, what is he saying and what is it all about? Well, you see something that's very synonymous, very closely related in the verse before verse 4. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit... For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is not speaking of the sorrow of the world. This is not speaking of sadness over worldly affairs. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 speaks of a worldly sorrow that worketh death. That doesn't sound like blessedness. That doesn't sound like happy are you if you mourn uh, over that. It's not speaking about Judas Iscariot in his state after he betrayed the Lord Jesus. But, but this mourning really has a fit to speaking specifically about it concerning a broken heartedness over sin. This isn't about to be some fire and brimstone sermon preaching against sin. But the truth is, we're in a fallen state. We're depraved. It, it came from Adam. And it has passed on to every single one of us. We all come short of the glory of God. Those who mourn that Jesus is speaking of here. We, we, we can hone in on something specific here. 
And it speaks of a spiritual occasion. The, the natural pretending mind comes to the reality of the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. And the result of that, that'll make a man mourn. That will make someone mourn. This mourning that blesses us results from the realization of seeing God for who He is, His holiness, God's perfection, His goodness, which leads us to see that depraved natural state that we're in. It's mourning over our fallen sinful nature. This realization of God and the realization of ourselves and and who God is and what God is and, and what we are results in our experience of guilt over our behavior, over our manner, over a lifestyle. This word mourning, it, it is such a strong word here that we're sharing. It's, it's deeper than, than, than the experience that results of the death of a loved one. It's, it's deeper than, than our hardest tribulation that we face or any kind of loss. When we get to this word mourn, we're, we're talking about a very strong word. This is when sin, which belongs to us, comes to light before the eyes of a holy God. You know, we were separated from God. Because of sin, He made us and He lost us to sin. And he, he made a way to buy us back again through His own precious Son, Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord if you're here tonight and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you saw your need. You saw your need to be saved. And now that we're children of God, what happens? Sin tries to sidetrack us tries to get us sliding back away from walking with the Lord. Blessed are they that mourn over, and, and let's talk about it in the, in the aspect of over sin. It doesn't, it's not blessed are the self-righteous. It's not blessed are the rebellious. It's not blessed are the secret sinners. There's nothing happy about that. Oh, what a weight that puts upon us. But blessed are they that mourn. In Luke chapter 18, two men went up in the temple to pray. A Pharisee and a publican. And we see here in Luke 18, we first see... The Pharisee. And it says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. Whether he did that or not, he didn't do it with the right attitude by, by that prayer. Whether he did it or not, the Lord's not impressed. But the publican, in verse 13, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who ended up being congratulated? For their sorrow. Well, Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you, this man, the publican, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. David says in the 40th Psalm and the 12th verse, 
For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Mentioned, there was the mentioning of an honesty coming before God this morning. We never go wrong being honest before God. It should be pretty easy for us to do, knowing He knows everything. And it's not for His benefit that we're honest before God. We're not informing Him. It is for us. It is for us because blessed are they that mourn. This is what David says in verse 12. And and he's getting to know his Lord. We were talking about in Timothy team yesterday morning. Getting to know our God. Getting to, and we get to know Him by His Word. So, so after he has his moment of mourning in verse 12, David does in the 40th Psalm. Then he says, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Verse 16 He says, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. We see David mourn. And we see David Mary there rejoicing in the Lord. Blessed are they that mourn. What an event in David's life that was so full of sorrow that became such happiness, spiritual happiness. We read of the condition of the prodigal son and what he said in his heart in Luke Chapter 15. And verses 18 and 19. You know about the prodigal son and him collecting his wages and going off into the world to to try his own thing and to do his own thing. And, And he starts to come to his senses after a sinful experience in the world, and he says, here's his idea, here's what he's thinking in his mind, I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And then in verse 20, It says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, he noticed the prodigal son. He didn't say everything he had rehearsed to say. The father had interrupted it. And rejoicing. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, kill the fatted calf. Congratulations to the prodigal son. Congratulations to the younger son. I know people put emphasis on the older son and how he acted about it. But we still have some truth here about the younger son. And congratulations for his sorrow. Look what it did in his life and the celebration that came about. Why? Because it's a, it's a beautiful sign for a child of God mourning over sin. Our own, others, sin in general. One of my favorite morning manas that Pastor Stone has ever put out was titled, I Hate Sin. And he just went into talking about everything that sin causes and everything that sin does. And in our natural state, we love sin. But praise the Lord when He saves us. 
we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we start to love the things that He loves. And we start to hate the things that He hates. And we start to mourn over that which hurts us. Over that which hurts others. Mourning. It happens in salvation. And it happens throughout the life of the saved soul. It, it doesn't just happen when we're saved. This is a continual spiritual characteristic in the life of the child of God that the Christian experiences. I mean, we have a lot to mourn over, don't we? How about, how about the times that we could do more for the Lord? And we haven't. You ever mourn over that? How about the times that that we've held on to something and we didn't go to the Lord with a broken heart and, and ask Him for forgiveness, but continued on in it a little longer? How about when we have not forgiven others? That's enough to make us mourn, I reckon. How about the temptation to go wandering in the world? Demas was a fellow laborer of Paul, but he, but, he, but he looked at the world and he looked at the bright lights. He looks at how the, the devil decorates these things and, and tries to be appealing to our flesh and tempts us to, to go out in the world. How about mourning over even the thought of wandering out in the world? The more we walk with the Lord, the more we mourn over our offenses that are against Him. Even the offenses of others against the Lord. We grow just to, with, to hate sin, the 119th Psalm and the 53rd verse. Says this. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Burdened over the sin of this world. Burdened over the sin of others. How about the weeping prophet Jeremiah? Why did the prophet Jeremiah weep? What did he weep over? Jeremiah 13, 7, 13, 17 says this. But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears. Because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. Chapter 14, verse 17. Therefore, thou shalt say this word unto them. Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day. And let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach. With a very grievous blow. Jeremiah was weeping over the sins of the people and what was going on in the world. In Ezekiel chapter, chapter 9, we see more along these lines. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, 
he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. The mourners over sin were marked. Were marked as children of God with a spiritual characteristic in our lives of grieving and mourning over sin. The Lord is pleased with mourning over sin. How can I please the Lord? What makes the Lord happy? Mourning over sin. That pleases Him. And He says, we're going to be happy. In a, in a spiritual way, in a positive happy. We're going to be spiritually happy. Spiritually happy is the broken heart mourning in tears over sin. Well, I thought the Christian was supposed to be happy and joyful. And Brother Kenneth, you've made the statement that the Christian ought to be the most joyful person in the world. Blessed are they that mourn. We are, but, but not only are we spiritually happy, not only happy are you for those that mourn, but, but blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Lord removes our guilt. He lifts our burden. He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers it no more. We are free and fully forgiven because of the blood of Christ, He washes us white as snow. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we get saved, we enter into peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We were hostile toward God, but we came into peace with God. And as He leaves us on this earth, and we continue on this earth, we can experience the peace of God which passeth all understanding and it keeps our hearts and minds it puts a garrison it, it, it guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted when you when you preach against sin especially in this day and time more and more it's not a very popular subject but look how happy we are when we're burdened by it. It only makes sense. We're going to heaven where no sin is anymore. And we can't wait to get there. I'm getting to the end of the message. Let me go back. When we hurt before God over sin, we're healed by God. I say that's a happy state. That's a spiritually happy state. You know... Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Lord is holy. Mourn over sin. The Lord is holy. And the Lord is love. He heals. He comforts. He is righteous and He is merciful. He is judge and He's full of grace. We mourn. And we are blessed. And we are comforted. This happened for the very first time within the moment we were saved. I love to go to this fellow Zacchaeus in the Bible. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 5. Here was a crooked tax collector. And he was a short fellow. And somebody had obviously told him about Jesus Christ. And this short fellow crawled up in this tree because he heard Jesus was passing by and he wanted to see Him. And Jesus, being Jesus, knew His heart 
and said, come on down from that tree, Zacchaeus. Today, today, salvation is coming to thy house. We were changed in a day. We became a new creation in a moment that we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And don't tell me there's not an attitude about sin within salvation. That we don't, that, that we're choosing the Savior and we're not choosing sin. We're mourning, of, we were merry in sin in our natural state and now we're mourning over sin. And overwhelmed that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross and took the penalty for our sin. And then comes to live within us and His Holy Spirit takes up residence within us at that moment. We are comforted. The moment we're saved. And we mourn over sin. And then it happens daily in our lives. 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, if we go to God, if we agree with God, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that, word, that book of 1 John is written in the continual state. This is something continual in our lives that we deal with. The mourner is not only blessed and comforted though in the present by what God gives us by way of His Spirit living in us and the attitude about sin, but we're blessed because of the future. The mourner is focused on heaven. The mourner, it goes hand in hand, the desire for heaven, the praising of God for being with Him in a sinless eternity. Because of our future, we are encouraged. Within, you know, within mourning over our sin, there, there's chastening. When we, when we come before God honestly, because He loves us, He's going to chasten us. And, and the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, this seems grievous to us in the process. But it's working out something real good in our lives. The Bible speaks of a far more eternal, uh, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul said that to Corinth in the second letter. We know in that second letter to Corinth, Paul was, Paul was mourning over their sin. And God gave him the job of having the Holy Spirit write through him to them about those things so that they can improve, so that they can repent, so that, so that those things can be fixed. So Paul is, is in grieving and, and mourning over the church at Corinth, but he wrote this, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Mourning over sin, it adds to our rejoicing. And I hope something's happening here that, that, that has helped me. And that is, you know, we're, we're not sad Christians. We're not down in the dumps. We're rejoicing. But, but we have a new attitude about sin that happens in the will of God. And so the rejoicing Christian is going to be a mourning Christian. We're going to grieve over those things. And, and happy are you, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That word comfort, it means refreshed. It means cheered. The child of God is refreshed and cheered when we mourn. Over sin. We are divinely comforted by the Lord. How, how does He do that? You know, think for just a second. How does the Lord comfort His people? Well, it, just in, in relationship and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. His name is Comforter. And, and He does that. But 
But how about those who minister to those who mourn? I tell you what, that's, that's quite an event. That's quite a sight. That's quite an experience with someone. When they confess, I can't forgive any sins at all. And I've never told anyone to confess anything to me. Bible says confess your faults one to another. Nobody's doing, coming and telling me that for forgiveness. But in their mourning, they'll confess that. They'll talk about it. And, and, and I tell you what, it's so easy to minister to someone who is doing what the Holy Spirit would affect us to do as children of God. To mourn over our sin. God comforts us by, by those He would send our way to minister to us. By an encouraging word from a brother and sister in Christ. Or when we shower ourselves in the promises of God. We don't deserve His forgiveness. We're unworthy. But, but He forgives us. And we think about our lost state and how much we love sin. And we can just rejoice in the fact that we're grieving in our hearts over the guilt of it. The warm servants and the Word of God. It helps us to set our affections on things above. Not on this earth. Oh, one day, one day we're going to worship the Lord in purity. And that sin nature is going to be gone. And all sin's going to be gone. And Satan's going to be cast into the lake of fire. Joy is coming in the morning for the child of God. It is coming one day. We are accepted in the beloved. Our citizenship is is in heaven. Listen to Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 10. It says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Here we go. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We sorrow over sin now. We sigh over it. When is that going to end? When does the change happen? One day we're going to glory. One day Jesus is coming to the clouds and He's taking us up and that sin nature is staying behind. The flesh is going to, to be no more. We're going to the Lord. We're going to receive a glorified body. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to have a glad reunion day with all of those who have be believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be no more division, no more strife, no more sin. And, and right now, we, it's in line with where we're going that we grieve over sin. All mourning's going to be gone one day. Separated from this flesh, the Lord's going to wipe away all tears. We'll rejoice that there is no more mourning in heaven. And so as we see this vital sign, spiritual vital sign that takes place in the child of God, it would lead us to examine ourselves tonight. To examine ourselves of those who are truly saved and the experience of those who are saved. The spiritual happiness, the refreshing, the cheering of our lives when we come before God broken broken over our own sin and mourning over the sin in this world. And we're, and we're refreshed by God when we do. Has that ever happened in your life? I, I recall 
so many. The testimony when people are saved. And they wanted the Savior. And they wanted their sins forgiven. Sin was an issue there. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And when we're saved, well, Christ comes to live in you, the hope of glory. Holy Spirit comes to live within us. We can't have a new attitude about sin in our natural state. But when the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, who is in perfect agreement with the Word of God, we rejoice over that which is good, we grieve, and we mourn over that which is not. Anyone here who has never been saved, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to save you from your sins? See, see He's saving us from our sins. And we mourn over it. That's something we could have never done before. We, before, we, we got a little scared when we got caught. But now, all alone with God, with no one knowing, we, we mourn and we grieve over our sins. Is, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, we pray that, that you would trust Him tonight. That you would even, even come forward down this aisle. And it's as simple as, I know I'm a sinner, and I want Jesus to save me from my sins. And for the child of God, what a joyful life we have. And part of that life being joyful is our mourning over sin. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let us pray. Almighty God in heaven, as we bow before you tonight, we just want to praise your name for the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ made on the cross at Calvary for all of our sins, that he was buried and he resurrected from the grave and he defeated our sins. And your son is the only way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And He defeated our sin. And Lord, there's a change that takes place in our lives whenever You save us. It's, there's something that happens that we could never do about sin before. We, we, we went over it and we, we grieve and, and we grow to hate it. We hate its effects. Upon our lives. We hate how it hurts others. We grieve how it hurts others. Lord if anyone would come to Jesus tonight. They would be set free. They would be free of their sins. The, your word says. If the son therefore shall make you free. Ye shall be free indeed. I want to thank you for the power of your salvation tonight. And if there's one here who doesn't know you that they would come to know you tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Could everyone please rise as we have a time of invitation? Anyone here tonight who realizes they do not know Jesus, would you trust Him? It's 249.